Jaime Forty here. I'm about to blow your mind. Did you know that the interests of Jews and the interests of Germans, right, are not already always 100% aligned? Did you know that the interests of Christians and Jews and Muslims are not always 100% aligned? Did you know that basically between the year 300 and approximately the year 1800, the interests of Christians and Jews in Europe tended to run in opposite directions. And since about 1800, since the age of the Enlightenment, the interests of Jews and Christians have tended to run parallel. As societies have become more secular, Jews and Christians have found things in common. Now, well may you say, 40, surely it is marked out by the will of heaven that the interests of Jews and Christians will forevermore be in perfect alignment, just swelling and growing and developing and becoming bigger and stronger together, right? It's just marked out by the will of heaven that this is inevitable. This is the only way that things can move forward. And I regret to inform you that, no, this is not the only way that things can move forward. We, We may very well have a situation, say, in the United States of America, where the interests of Germans, oh, the interests of Christians and the interests of Jews are not 100% aligned. In fact, we may very well have the development of, uh, say, Christian nationalism in the United States and elsewhere in the Western world. And that might mean that the, that the interests of Jews and the interests of Christians are quite distinct. So... Yeah, it's tempting to think that uh, the way things have been for the past couple hundred years, this is just inevitable, all right? Jews, Christians together, uh, just uh, moving forward from here on out, just moving in sync, ebony and ivory. But no, right? you may very well get a rise of Christian nationalism, which uh, puts a priority on the interests of Christians. And more shocking news, the interests of Christians are not always 100% aligned with the interests of Jews in the interests of Jews, not necessarily 100% aligned with the interests of Christians. And more shocking news, the interests of the United States of America, not always 100% aligned with the interests of the Jewish state of Israel. And so sometimes these two states, these two groups have clashing interests. What the hell? This is shocking. You're just blowing my mind, man. So let me give you some low IQ content from Fox on News. On a little longer. China scooping up U.S. farmland. Another indictment, and this one's related to January 6th. That's why we're number one in cable news, Fox News Channel. It's been over three years since the pandemic, and millions of Americans are still working remotely. But there's now a new excuse not to go back to work. Racism. The L.A. Times is reporting that black workers don't want to return to the office because the office is racist, so they prefer to stay home. White workers, oh, you're gonna have to commute in. The LA Times write this, Laron Barton weighed his options, he realized what he had to do. Working remotely during the pandemic showed him a whole different lifestyle. No commute, more time with his family, and a break from the onslaught of microaggressions and other racist behavior he'd had to endure. The LA Times, even telling neurodivergent people, people who experience mental abnormalities, that workplace is ableist, and some are eating it up. So I just got yelled at for asking a very reasonable question. So I'm applying to go somewhere, and I just wanted to know, are there accommodations for people who struggle with time blindness and being on time? They actually started yelling at me and saying that accommodations for time blindness doesn't exist, and if you struggle with being on time, you'll never be able to get a job. I think that just anybody who thinks it's okay to just treat people like that, yeah, that culture needs to be dismantled. Fox News host Julie Banderas joins me now. All right, so Julie, we need to segregate ourselves to fight racism. Is that what the LA Times is saying? I think they're implying that. But what I think the pandemic has done is given birth to a bunch of pansies. And it was like the longest, most arduous labor ever without uh, an epidural. That's what we have basically given (laughs) birth to. I wouldn't know what that feels like. Oh, I did. 
I was 10 centimeters dilated. I'm like, get it in before it comes out. But no, <laughs> seriously, bad. it's really sad because this is basically America at its worst. The pandemic is over. There's no excuse. Get your butt to work. If you don't want to show up to work, find another job. In fact, 3% in 2021 of African-American white-collar workers did not want to return to work as opposed to 21% of white Americans. So I guess even white people don't want to show up to work. Yeah, I don't think it has anything to do with racism. And I, I don't think, think it has like anything to do with racism. Home. It's called laziness. That's what it's called. <laughs> So is the office just a bunch of microaggressions? I, mean, I think everybody gets treated basically how they perform. You know, in this article, it was interesting. Somebody actually complained, you know, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Like, if I talk too much, then I'm saying, being told I'm socializing too much. If I'm not engaging enough. So people are, have social anxiety. I think the pandemic has absolutely turned everybody into a big snowflake. People can't, they don't know how to so socialize anymore. They'd rather hide behind their computers. You and know how to socialize pretty wear well. Wear sweatpants. <laughs> Well, I've never had a problem with that. I do enjoy. You actually need nice more social anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> I have such social anxiety. I don't know if you've noticed. Okay, and what are you again? You're you're not Latino. You are English. I am actually British and you're, Colombian. You're Colombian. But I am brave enough as a half Colombian to show up to work every day. <laughs> so, do they never mention the Colombians? Do the, do no. the Hispanics or the Latinos are they, they afraid to go back to it's work? It's just the African Americans. The African -Americans. But I'm sure. I'm sure if you ask a bunch of Spanish people, they'll say they want to stay home too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Really, I don't think there's any discrimination on the no, laziness. In this I, I think I think everybody definitely enjoys working from home, especially <laughs> in LA County. Yeah, oh God. with the weather out there. Thank Absolutely. you very much, Julie. Sure thing. Thanks, Julie. Okay, uh, we'll get to tonight's topic in just a second. What's going on in America? Living in America is, is funny. It's like you have to laugh to keep from crying. So I go to get blood work done, right? Because I'm like, oh, let me check myself, make sure my vitamin levels is good, my hormone levels, I have PCOS. Let's, you know, check some shit out. And the lady says, oh, well, you have insurance, but it'd be better that you just pay out of pocket. And I'm like, well, what's the point of having insurance then? And she's like, well, you have a $7,000 deductible. So you have to spend $7,000 before your insurance even helps you. So it's better to just pay out of pocket. I'm like, well, I pay 200 something a month, you know, every month. Does that payment at least go to the $7,000 deductible? And she's like, no. <laughs> so then I was like, well, what will happen if I just cancel my insurance? And they're like, oh, well, then you'll be penalized, you know, during tax time. <laughs> if that ain't the most gangsta shit, yeah, bitch, pay us $200 a month just to say you have us, but we're not going to help you until you pay $7,000. And if you decide not to keep us, you will be penalized, bitch. I feel like this is ran by the mafia. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I pay about $600 a month in health insurance, and I, too, have a $7,000 deductible, right? So this is, this is simply reality, all right? And you, you do get some benefits from, from that, that plan, all right? Uh, only $7,000. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that seems lovely. What's the what's the context? They're running away from police. They just kids having fun. Good old time. Okay, police early announced they would deploy a significant number of officers of the central London shopping street over the next twenty four hours, responding to reports of a shoplifting event on social media sites such as TikTok and Snapchat. So a post on TikTok appeared to promote an organized robbery of an Oxford Street store with a date, a time and even a dress code. Okay, let's get to tonight's main topic. Let's talk about the relationship between Germans and Jews. My father said there are two kinds of people in the world, Jews and Nazis. Hmm, I think uh, reality is a little more complicated than that, but uh, what the heck. So 2016 documentary when here. I meet Germans, I'm always in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, how do you really feel about Jews? Okay, so if you have a strong in-group identity, right, your primary concern is going to be how will outsiders relate to and treat and regard your in-group. So I don't think this is particularly unusual. I would think someone with a strong, say, in-group black identity or gay identity would have similar thoughts. 
Okay, 70 years have passed since World War II. Many Jews continue to feel suspicious of Germans and Germany. Right, this uh, documentary came out in 2016. American Jew and non-Jewish German were equally surprised by this development. They decided to host a dinner for non-Jewish Americans and uh, non-Jewish Germans and Jewish Germans. Second generation or third generation. And I think most of us feel still very directly connected to this topic. So isn't it wonderful that uh, Jews are moving back to Germany? All right, hundreds of thousands of Jews now back in Germany. Isn't it wonderful that Germany has become user-friendly for Jews? Right? Isn't it wonderful when your homeland becomes user-friendly for a minority group? Now, it is wonderful for the minority group, and it also has many benefits for the majority, but it also comes at an enormous price. The reason that Jews feel so comfortable in Germany now is because there is a dramatic decline in in-group identity, patriotism, nationalism, pride among Germans. Right? This is not good for Germans. This is really, really bad for Germans. Right? The greatest resource that you can have as an individual is to feel good about yourself for, for good reason, to have self-respect, to feel like you have some agency in your life, that you have you know, some control over your reactions and your words and your behavior, and that you have reason to feel proud of the direction that your life is going and the quality of your relationships, the quality of your savings, the quality of your work, quality of your hobbies, the quality of how you spend your time, the quality of your volunteering. Right? About the greatest resource you can have is to feel good about yourself for good reason. And about the greatest resource a nation can have is to feel good about itself for good reasons. And so Germans feeling bad about themselves, as so many Germans seem to do, is really bad for Germany and not necessarily doing a favor for the world, right? That uh, learning about the Holocaust is about the number one thing in German education for kids these days, according to some reports. I am no expert on German education of children. is probably not good for Germans and probably not good for Jews because whenever a group, you know, oversteps, you know, overreaches, Right, there is a blowback. So what works for the individual? Having good reasons to feel good about yourself, to respect yourself. Same for a nation. Right? Greatest resources of a nation is not oil. Right? It's not petrodollars. It's not uh, high-tech uh, manufacturing. The greatest resource for a nation is self-respect, a good narrative about itself. You know, good, rational empirical reasons to feel good about themselves. Now, all the good feelings then have to be rational and empirical, but there should be some rational, firm, you know, historical, empirical reason for why you feel good about yourself as a nation, not just as an individual. Now, it can be adaptive to feel good about yourself beyond what's reasonable and rational, and it can be adaptive for a nation to feel good about itself beyond what is reasonable and rational. But a people that doesn't feel good about themselves, right? A people that doesn't have a hero system is not long for this world, right? A, a tribe that loses all its markers of meaning, loses its hero system, it uh, will just basically give up, stop reproducing. And Germans have stopped reproducing, right? They, they despise their armed forces, right? Any nation that despises its armed forces is not, uh, it's not long for this world. If you don't respect yourself enough as a people to want to defend yourself, particularly when you live in a hostile environment such as Germany, right? Germany doesn't have any natural defenses. And if you don't respect your armed forces, you don't venerate the sacrifice of people who join the armed forces are making, if you don't respect them, you're, you're a nation not long for this world. So yeah, on the one hand, it's super great that Germany's become so user-friendly for Jews, but some of what's making Germany so user-friendly for Jews is really, really bad for Germans. German, I say it in a hard way. And when I say Jewish, I say it in a very soft yes. and careful way. It still feels awkward to use this word, Juden und Deutschland, whereas in English, I can say it. Sometimes I... And Louis says, last time Germans had nationalism under Hitler, they were given the worst collective punishment ever handed out in modern times, you expect them to try that again. Guess what? There are different ways of uh, practicing nationalism, right? There are different ways with identifying your people, right? It's not like 
all nationalists get the results that uh, Germans got after the end of World War II. Right? There's an exceptional circumstance that uh, Germans largely brought on themselves. So, yeah, there are healthy and unhealthy ways to develop an in-group identity. That's true for individuals. It's true for groups. It's true for communities. It's true for religious groups, for racial groups, for ethnic groups, for professional groups. Right? There are healthy and unhealthy ways of developing an in-group identity. And so Germans developed an unhealthy, maladaptive form of high in-group identity during the 1930s that led to a disaster for them. I'm not even talking about the world. I'm not even talking about the, the bad results for Jews and for, for non-Germans. I'm just talking about the bad results for Germans. So sometimes increasing your in-group identity is a bad idea. Sometimes increasing your in-group identity is a good idea, right? There is no one approach to life that's simply marked out by the will of heaven to always work in all circumstances. Plenty of people, when they increase their in-group identity, they become obnoxious. They become you know, blatantly racist, so they tick off everyone around them, and they develop all sorts of troubles in their life. So you can develop your national feelings, your in-group identity, your love and affection for your people in smarter ways or dumber ways. You can exemplify and embody your in-group identity in smart ways or dumb ways at work, in socializing, when riding public transport, when interacting with strangers. Right? It's not like developing an in-group identity is always good or always bad for you. It's not like there's only you know, good ways to have an in-group identity. There are lots of ways to have an in-group identity that will be absolutely disastrous for you. Not everyone can handle having a strong, intense in-group identity. But listen to Sean Hannity. Surely, surely he will point us you know, the, the way forward. I struggle with my identity. I don't know. Uh... This is a secular... I presume secular left-wing German teacher who is not Jewish. Uh, shall I feel somehow guilty? Do I say the right things? Isn't it shameful to say that my grandfather who died in the war, I never met him and he left three little children. Is he a victim? Is he a perpetrator? What is he? Is it even allowed for me to, to uh, ask these questions? So the line between victim and perpetrator isn't always clear. Most of us are sometimes victims, sometimes perpetrators. Uh, might be true for your grandfather as well. I was home visiting my parents, and I left a book behind about German victims. And my mother said, what is this book? Look, any group, any individual can make an entirely empirical, fact-based account. They can develop a narrative about why they as individuals or they as a group are victims. Germans could do it, Jews could do it, blacks could do it, gays could do it. Every group can build a victimhood narrative and you cannot have an in-group identity without having a substantial victimhood narrative. Right? In-group identity, nationalism always goes hand in hand with a sense of victimization. Right? There's no nationalism without a sense of victimization. There's no strong in-group identity without a sense of being a victim. True for Jews, true for Germans, true for everyone. You know, what's a German victim? My aunt lost one of her children in Auschwitz, and she survived. And every single day, every single day that she lived, every single day, she would talk about it. Maybe at lunch, maybe at dinner, maybe in the morning. But she was never able to forget that through a fence she saw her child and lost it. It was not a day where she didn't think about it. This is in the back of my mind. So this will always stay. So I can't erase it. All right, so there's some, some complications between uh, Germans and Jews, all right? The, the story is not a, a smooth one. This is Dr. Fritz Stern, professor of modern European history. The restrictions being ever greater, uh, I, I felt very remote to put it with, with, with a certain measure of hatred. So the Stern family escaped Nazi persecution, immigrated to America in 1938. Was the most Christian of all. And his entire family converted to Christianity. On my father's side, my grandparents converted. I didn't know that I was... People respond to incentives. Sometimes people change religions because it is incentivized to do so. It's by Nazi definition, Jewish. There was the Nazis who made, made me Jewish again. And then I became... 
kind of proud of it. Okay, so we have a lot of Israelis moving to to Germany. We've got a big Chabad set up in in Germany. We've got this Israeli musician here who moved to Germany. You know, like uh, she, she could say like things, ah, you know, the Germans, the Nazis, you know. But at the same time, you know, uh, the, the Germans, die machen gute Sachen, you know, they make good things, you know. Gleichzeitig, you know, it's Auschwitz and Mercedes. So, yeah, uh, Germans do tend to produce you know, high-quality goods. It's a generational thing because the third generation in Israel, uh, many of them, they come to Berlin as the new holy land. And uh, it's, it's like the big thing. And so why on earth would Berlin be the new holy land for Jews? Because different Jews experience life differently and have different hero systems, right? If your hero system revolves around artistic self-expression, Right, Berlin may very well be a much holier land for you than the land of Israel. And this is quite odd. I'm, I mean that after only 50, 60, 70 well, years... Well, that it's a land of yes, opportunities. It, it has uh, changed uh, a lot because people are upset and they are disappointed by Israeli politics. Of and course, they don't with, see with very good that reasons. It's, I mean, I can't speak for the Israelis, but uh, I guess... So the left has been essentially crushed in Israel. Israel is steadily moving more and more to the right. So if you're a left-wing Jew, you're going to be appalled by the direction of Israeli politics. And it doesn't mean you're a self-hating Jew. It just means that you have other values that are higher than the, the, the Jewish collective state interest. Right? For, for example, if you're on the left, it means that there are other values that are higher than racial and ethnic and religious identity such as you know, equality and your, your understandings of freedom and uh, classical liberalism or modern liberalism. It means sure. that uh, they, they see that Germany has changed and that uh, they can trust <clears throat> the democracy Yes, I think Germany. it's really only because Berlin has become trendy. That's the only reason. I don't, oh, think, I don't think there's so some, much thought behind no, it. No, I think you must have some... Why has Berlin become trendy? Because it's a heroic place for some people with a certain value system, with a certain hero system. Right? There's a lot of wonderful things about Berlin. Right? There are a lot of wonderful things about Sydney, Australia. Not for everyone. Feeling of comfort uh, and mm. security. And trust, right. to a great come. city. Yes, Berlin is a great city. It's a great city. city. Of still, course you feel comfort. But it's great. still, you must have some feeling of comfort to come here. Right, nothing good happens between people until there's a feeling of comfort. So there's no feeling of comfort between... Arabs and Israelis. There's no feeling of comfort between Jewish Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, there's no feeling of comfort between all sorts of groups in the world. As long as people are in active conflict, uh, just suggesting that uh, individuals just forgive and forget is not a viable strategy. All right. So when right-wing pundits talk about how America's in a civil war, all right, they are making people less mentally healthy, less adaptive to, to life because you feel unsafe when you believe even if you just one percent believe dennis prager when he says america is in the midst of a civil war if right-wing pundits are telling you you know joe biden's the worst administration ever that democrats are you know working on destroying america you are going to feel less safe in the world you'll have less mental health you'll be less adaptive to reality right you'll be less prosperous Nothing good can happen until people develop a sense of safety, an appropriate level of safety. And so this is one reason why I loathe almost all right-wing punditry, which, seen, which seeks to whip up hysteria about what an unsafe position we're in under the Democrats, when it's absolute nonsense. For 99% of people, 99% of the time, it doesn't matter to your real life whether Joe Biden or Donald Trump is president. And so... Jews right now in Germany feel safe. And this comes at a certain price to German in-group identity. But yeah, it's good for Jews. It's good for many Germans who don't believe in nationalism. It's good for many other minority groups such as Arabs. So this is an Israeli who's married a German non-Jew. No, this is, this is from a, a synagogue performance. But we're going to this is over Chabad, time, Chabad Rabbi. a community. Yehuda Taktol, head of Chabad in Berlin. Unity has developed. And today, there is a thriving Jewish life in Berlin. 
20 years ago, there were 30,000 Jews here. Today, there are 200,000 Jews. It's true, many people in America, I'm often in New York, tell me, who should care? Why should we care for the Jews in Germany? I say, look, if Jews should move to Germany or not, it's a completely irrelevant question. The fact is they are there. If they are there, we have to teach them the warmth and the love and the joy and the radiance. And Louis says, safety breeds stagnation. Soft times make soft people. Hard times make hard people. Lack of safety gets people moving and motivates actions. Yeah, most people will make worse decisions under stress than they will from a time of safety. But in a time of high anxiety and danger, yeah, some people will excel. Most people will not. It's on the happiness and the spirit of Judaism. That's what it's about. Chabad opened up in Berlin, and Rabbi Yehuda Teichel set up a Hanukkah in front of the Brandenburg Gate, which was as large as the Brandenburg Gate itself. I couldn't believe it. This made all the difference to me. I said, oh, wow, Hanukkah in front of the Brandenburg Gate. I mean, I can see it in West Palm Beach. I can see it in Miami. I can see it in New York. I can't see it in Berlin, let alone a huge one like that. So uh, that's the Jewish life we have now in Berlin. The decision to come to Germany was not such a big issue for me. As a musician, really, you, you just go. Right, this is Yuval Halpern. Right, if your primary value is music or art or a certain type of cosmetology, cosmopolitan culture, then yeah, it makes sense that you'd move from Israel to Germany. We're the best place for you to study, and that's why I came to Germany. Yeah, so this is Israeli teaching German non-Jews to lift their voices to Christ. Chat says, the left is not being crushed either in the U.S. or in Israeli law schools or among most judges. Trump made some headway. And we see the progressive media organized pushback still going on in Israel about this. This is these people who are known to be uh, Nazis and uh, their grandparents were all in the Second World War and they tried to kill you. This is this education you kind of get in Israel. And the chat says the weather is better in Israel. Well, it depends on what type of weather you like. So the first thing you do with a German is you think, oh, what did his grandparent do in the Second World War? That's his first thing you do. And then you meet them and they're actually nice. You say, well, OK, they're actually nice. So all sorts of people are horrible in certain sectors of their life, dishonest in certain sectors of their life, reprehensible in other sectors of their life, heroic in other parts of their life, uh, nasty in some parts of their life, peace loving in other parts of their life. Right? The situation frequently determines our behavior you know, much more than any innate characteristics. People are complicated. Now, we try to boil our friends down because we want to maintain a positive uh, feeling about them. And so we just reinterpret the bad things they do if we find out about them as you know, not representative and we'll make excuse if it's a friend or a member of our in-group. Meeting my wife was, for both of us, very exotic. For her to know somebody out of Israel and for me to know somebody from Germany, I think this is an important aspect of our relationship. And of course, these themes came up. Will I come to the family and they'll say, oh, he's Jewish, is there anti-Semitism? And the Germans are, of course, very, very afraid to say something that will hurt the Israelis and they're really trying to be very kind and, and nice. As an Israeli, if you say, where are you from? I say, Israeli. I would see this kind of like, oh, let's be very nice now because... Right, so as long as people don't feel safe and go to an exaggerated or extreme effort to be nice, you're not going to have real congress between people. He's Israeli and I mean, once I was stopped by a police car um, and I showed him my... I, I, did nearly an accident. Actually, it was very, very dangerous. But he stopped me and said, did you see you, you nearly crashed into that truck? And your mirror hit. And then I gave him my Israeli license. I don't know if that was the reason. He cut me some slack. But it's always there, this kind of cycle of, we did it. It's our fault. Forgive us. Feel guilty. I mean, there's no day that doesn't go in the German press without articles somehow related to the Holocaust or the second. Look, if you did not participate as a perpetrator in the Holocaust, you should not feel guilty or ashamed. 
uh, as a German or as a European or as a Christian for what went on there because you didn't do it, you shouldn't feel bad about it. In World War. So the subject is always there, which is actually also very similar to Israelis. So we're kind of connected in a very uh, strange way um, that we both have this all the time being fed to us. All right, this is a 2016 documentary on Amazon, Germans and Jews. We were so much exposed to all... All right, back to this dinner party between uh, Jews, many Israelis, and uh, non-Jewish Germans. Those, you know, bulldozers pushing the, the, the corpses and everything, you know, from a very early age, in each Yom Shoah, you know, that's why in Israel you also... So Yom HaShoah means Holocaust Remembrance Day. We have uh, this Shoah humor, which here, you know, to the ears of, of German people, it's like blasphemy. Now that's the difference if you see the, this perspective, um, you, you see the corpses um, pushing by bulldozers. As a German, you can't find any humor in that. No, no, no. So, so, so as, that is the different not, perspective. Not, not, that is the, no, 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 I, I don't want to, I don't the want the to. Uh, it's the accumulation <laughs> of, it's I, the accumulation yeah. of these things when you expose it over and over yeah, and but, but, over and over again. But the Germans are also uh, accumulated with that. It's the victim, it's the victim uh, uh, privilege. And the chat says the only progress Donald Trump made was in getting the right to lay down, do nothing for four years. He placed three conservatives on the U.S. Supreme Court. All right. And he crushed immigration to this country in 2020. So he did did some significant things to, to enjoy. You. No, but I'm not putting, I'm not putting myself in. You, don't want to debate that. you are completely all right. Uh, I don't want to debate that. And Louis says like, Trump supporters heard what they wanted to hear on Twitter and then they went back to sleep. Yes. Yeah, Louis sees further than you do. He sees more deeply than you do. He is wiser than you are. I mean, that's a big reason why we come together and do this. We're all competing who sees things more clearly, who has their priorities right. So, welcome to the show, Louis. Very Jewish kind of answering a question is to ask a question. Are you a proud German? Uh, Do you know many Germans are proud no, to be German? If it's, it's not sexy, it is not sexy to be German. Americans are proud to be American. Um, proud is a yes. word. Yeah. Really? I'm, 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 I'm honest? I, I yeah, so this is a problem that it seems like many, if not most, Germans have in being proud about their German identity. Like, if you can't take pride in your individual life or in your community or your nation, that's a really bad sign for you, for your community, and for your nation. Right? The, the healthy thing is to take pride in your people. I, I, I feel sometimes like a patriot on, on democracy and on, on, like on human rights. I yeah, so feeling like a patriotic German because Germany has... Uh, democracy and human rights is not nationalism, right? That's not feeling good about your people. That's uh, feeling good about certain bureaucratic processes and certain delusions that uh, uh, the, there are these things called human rights. Right? That, that's no basis for developing a strong in-group identity among your people. There's no basis for developing a strong nation state. There's no basis for developing your national identity. This is really bad for the German people. I think that is uh, the only thing you can create such a feeling any, anymore. And in, in this sense, I, 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 feel, I, I feel very connected to my country and to my culture. The German yeah, he feels very connected to his country and culture on the basis of uh, democratic processes and laws about human rights. All right? That's no basis for feeling connected to your people or your country. All right? That's exceedingly weak. That's like loving your children because they agree with you about some legal or philosophical matter. You should love your children because they are your children. You should love your people because they are your people. You should love your nation state because you live there. And you, you, I would hope that you'd have descendants who will live there. German identity is, is tainted. They say, I am not a German, I am a European. Because that sounds... Uh, pro okay, this is Herbert Weber, a teacher. I, secular left non-Jewish German giving really weak bases for loving his people. Aggressive, that sounds multicultural, uh, 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 open-minded. Uh, I'm German sounds, uh, I'm militarist, I'm, 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 I'm narrow-minded, I'm, 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 you know what I mean. I studied abroad, I lived in, in England, I lived in Brussels, I lived in New York. 
And wherever I came, the biggest compliment you could possibly give to me was to say, oh, you're not German. You don't seem German to us. Okay, and this is a woman who I presume is not Jewish, a non-Jewish German woman. Us. That's interesting. I never felt comfortable being German. Sometimes people say, oh, you could be Jewish too because I have a very long nose, I have this curly hair. That was the biggest compliment you could possibly make, honestly. <laughs> All right, that's really Hardly sad. Hardly stopped to, to hold in my hands, literally. And I remember I was looking at it over and over and watching those pictures of their room on, on top of the house. It had a huge impact on me. I could not lose the feeling of deep guilt. All right, she didn't participate in the Holocaust. She should not be feeling deep guilt about the Holocaust. Full and positive and necessary Holocaust education was and is for German society. There have been many... All sorts of things are positive and necessary, uh, but you can take them too far. You can go too long. You can do it in, in too much depth. And that's what it sounds like with regard to the role of the Holocaust in German education. Many very problematic developments in that process, where people over-identify with the victims where they actually learn a lot about the Holocaust, but the only images they see are of Jews as victims. Right, in some circumstances, Jews will be victims, and in other circumstances, Jews will be perpetrators. But in some situations, Germans will be victims. In other situations, Germans will be perpetrators. No people is willed by, the, willed by heaven to inevitably always be perpetrators or to always be victims. And any kind of relaxed, open, but also um, dis discussion-friendly interaction uh, with Jewish Germans or Jews who live in Germany uh, becomes very difficult. And Louis says the supposed right-wing Supreme Court, it's effectively a right-wing Supreme Court, has had zero impact. They made abortions inc include a vacation to a neighboring state. All right, uh, many really dumb people can't figure out how to go to a neighboring state to get an abortion. So you have a higher IQ than average, and so all sorts of things that you take for granted are going to have very negative repercussions for people who don't have it together enough, right? aren't sufficiently capable to travel to another state and get an abortion. God. In my opinion, anything that is not considered 100% German and whatever that might be will not be accepted by the German population as German. For instance, I always considered myself German while I was in school. I wasn't. So, yeah, in traditional Jewish life, the, the term Goyish, right, which literally simply means non-Jew, but increasingly the more traditional you go in Jewish life, the more the term Goy or, or Goyish takes on a negative connotation and uh, rabbis are increasingly reluctant in Orthodox Judaism, the way it's been practiced over the last 40 years, to quote or to cite even non-Jewish sources or to cite sources that are not you know, fellow Orthodox Jews. So this is one symptom of growing you know, in-group identity. It happens among Germans, it happens among Jews, it happens among all groups. Different than the others. I had a different religion. But when I left school, when I left this protected society, I was never considered German. When people found out, and with my name, that was fairly easy, um, that... So most people in America have no problem believing that someone who's Jewish is also American. But uh, French national identity and German national identity is very different. So from a typical French or German perspective, no Jew can be French, no Jew can be German. Right? They just happen to be Jews who may very well have French citizenship or German citizenship, but they're not really German. So Germans and the French and you know, other countries in Europe have long enjoyed much tighter, closer in-group identity, social cohesion, and social trust that would just be unfathomable and mind-blowing for an American. Now, in-group identity, high cohesion, high social trust sounds amazing, right? Who wouldn't want that? But it comes at a price. Right? The price is that uh, life is a little tougher for you if you are a member of a minority group. In fact, it may be considerably tougher, much tougher. So in Australia, it's a much more coherent, cohesive, 
you know, in-group identifying country than the United States, right, which is makes life better for most Australians most of the time. The downside is that sometimes yeshiva kids or Jews who identifiably Jewish walking around will get beat up or will be the recipients of verbal abuse that would not happen in a more multicultural America. If I'd stayed in Australia, it would be highly unlikely that I would have ever converted to Orthodox Judaism. But in multicultural America, you have many more possibilities in life, but this comes at the price of cohesion, in-group identity, uh, social trust, uh, a sense of identification and you know, national bonds with your fellow American citizens. In America, generally speaking, Americans feel like they've got almost nothing in common with their fellow Americans. And so this makes it very easy to move from a Jewish to a Christian to a, to a gay to a Muslim to an atheist identity, right? America is probably about the easiest country in the world to switch between identities. That's because American identity has been so considerably watered down. It's not nearly as strong as it was in the 1950s. Right. America in the 1950s, probably the most cohesive, high trust version of America that we've ever had. I was Jewish. They always said, oh, you're Jewish. And they never, ever afterwards accepted me as German. I totally understand your point of view being insulted or offended by that. Mm -hmm. I just instinctively would okay. say, <laughs> Sorry. Jews always interrupt. No, I didn't That's say That's what I have to say. Uh, to you know, never let you finish. They always <laughs> interrupt. I want to get the well, sign. That's, that's anti Semitism. Okay, let's have a toast on that. Jews are unforgiving. No, all I want to say is it's just that Germans only know few Jews who live in Germany who have the identity you were describing as yours. So it used to be you didn't have to lock your house, it used to be you didn't have to lock your car because we had a high trust cohesive society where people identified with their fellow Americans. Now we don't have that high trust cohesive you know, high nationalist society. And so we've got you know, rampant amounts of crime and distrust between Americans and a general lack of sense of any meaningful connection just because we're both Americans. It's not something they, they don't feel comfortable with. It's just that, they, that they're not used to it for a very sad reason because there are so few. They'll happen to live most of their lives without ever encountering a Jew. Yeah, most Germans, he says, will live all of their lives without encountering a Jew. I would edit that to say without knowingly encountering a Jew. Right? I unknowingly encountered all sorts of Jews before I went to UCLA at age 22 and knowingly met Jews for the first time. And the Holocaust and Nazi crimes today is omnipresent in the German educational system. Most German students will two, three times encounter this. From all kinds of research, we know that German students know much more than most Western European and American students about World War II and the Holocaust. I heard Helmut Schmidt say repeatedly, years later, um, that, um, that his grandchildren know more about the Holocaust than about anything else in German history. And I mind you, I, I have my own feel, views on that. I think that's unfortunate. Um, it is unfortunate. This is Fritz Stern, a, a Jewish historian of European history, right? You should take pride in your country. You should take pride in your people. You should have a positive perspective on your people and your nation, your nation state. Okay, you, you must know about the Holocaust and so on. You must know about National Socialism. Uh, but that's not the entire history. It's not the only thing you should know. So 55% of Germans now agree with the statement today, 70 years after the end of World War II, we should no longer talk so much about the persecution of the Jews, we should put the past behind us. Even very famous writers and intellectuals spoke out for that position, but I think people about the Holocaust... Let me rewind here. Schlussstrich is the German expression for the idea that we should stop the discussion about the Holocaust. Even very famous writers and intellectuals spoke out for that position. But I think people who address the issue in this way um, forget that we are responsible for a process in which the younger generations 
get not only a knowledge but also a feeling for the consequences of our own past. I'm not shocked to hear it again that there is in Germany hatred against the Jews. Yeah, if you have any kind of strong in-group identity, you very likely have negative feelings about our groups. This is not something that's just unique between Germans and Jews. If you would ask, do you hate Jews or are you anti-Semitic? And of course they would say, uh, deny. Why do different groups hate each other frequently? It's because they have vital conflicts of interest. Right, but uh, if you ask them, uh, do you think that the Jews have too much influence? Uh, of course. If you live outside Israel, it's nothing new. In my everyday life, I would not feel Jewish. But when you say I come from Israel, immediately, it's immediately uh, 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 towards a German person, it's okay. I'm a Jew from this moment on. And I know also that now the thought of my opponent, of my, uh, you know, as a Jew, is he for or against the Palestinians? And it is like that. It is like that. It's kind of a mistake of people to just think, oh, he's Jewish, he's responsible for Israel, even though he could be Jewish and never even been to Israel, or he's religious. It's like if you would take somebody Muslim and say, well, why do you kill so many people in Syria? I think we have today new, new forms die des Antisemitismus, über die wir reden müssen, ist nämlich, okay, wie man an dem Thema Israel sich abarbeiten kann. Criticism People. of Israel will be used as a vehicle to actually turn the victims into the perpetrators and the perpetrators into the victims, right? To emphasize... That's because no group is ruled out by the will of heaven to only be perpetrators and to only be victims. Uh, things the other way around, and the classical one is, of course, uh, but now these Jews and Israelis do the same thing to the Palestinians as, as um, uh, we did uh, to the Jews. The political debate in Germany is difficult. If you criticize the Israeli government for what they did in the occupied territories, very fastly you are claimed to be anti-Semit. They say, um, why don't you criticize um, um, violation of human rights in Iran? Why don't you criticize uh, a violation of human um, uh, rights in, in, in Sudan? Why in Israel? The Gaza war of 2014 was used by... And a question in the chat in Weimar, Germany. How much did the interest of the average Jew conflict with those of his non-Jewish counterpart? Well, in Weimar, Germany, there wasn't a high in-group German identity. So when... German Gentiles developed a high in-group identity with the rise of Hitler, then obviously anyone who's outside the group it becomes a problem. Groups in an unacceptable way for the expression of brutal and incredible uh, kinds of anti-Semitism. The difficulty, of course, is that we have to hold the space open for a critical discussion of the situation in the state of Israel, as we are used to do it with regard to our own uh, government and our own country. Germany is a different country than it was 20 years ago. Yes, it has a lot more immigrants, has a lot weaker in-group identity, it's less nationalist, it's less trusting of their fellow citizens, all right, less cohesive, all right, more crime. Right. Germans feel less and less in common with their fellow Germans. 20% right. of Germany's population has a migrant Many background, young Germans whatever today that means. come from backgrounds in the Arab world, in the Turkish world, where there is unfortunately widespread anti-Semitism. They're certainly not all anti-Semites, but they're coming out of this atmosphere where they're listening to television channels, they're going on internet, they're hearing a lot of negative things about Jews and it's created a whole new problem in teaching. Hearing negative things about Jews isn't what's causing people to be anti-Jewish. It's the perceived conflict of interest with Jews, such as if you believe that your religion is the true one, then obviously competing religions such as Judaism or Christianity or Islam 
Right, you're very likely to have some negative feelings about. German democratic values um, and in teaching the Holocaust to this generation. Of course there are challenges. Of course there are difficulties. Of course. This is the Chabad rabbi. Chabad next, all right, Lubavitches, this branch of Hasidim, they tend to have a pretty positive attitude on life. Of course there's anti-Semitism, of course there are problems. When I came to the kindergarten, 27th of February, 2007, when on the, on the toys there were swastikas painted, of course it was sad. But is that gonna take us off our track? No way, on the contrary. That shows how important it is to concentrate, to rebuild with a positive energy Jewish life. If in Europe uh, uh, any new like right-wing power will arise, it will not be from Germany. And there is, there are neo, neo Nazis here, there is an NPD, you know, like, uh, yeah, they exist, you know, it's a democratic country and they are there. But Germany had its share. And uh, therefore, if you're asking me, as a, I'm, I'm saying as a Jew. Uh, this is an Israeli Jewish uh, musician who moved to Germany commenting, but uh, why is there an extreme right, right? Because the extreme right sometimes has positions, perspectives, and coping strategies that are more adaptive to reality and better enable people to pass on their genes than other perspectives, right? Sometimes the extreme less has the most adaptive strategy. But I have to stress that I am an atheist, okay. But as, as a Jew still living in Germany, I feel it's much, much safer than living in Israel. And it, it probably is. It's probably much safer for Jews now to live in Germany than it is to live in Israel. Much safer. Much more relaxing, right? much less stress, much fewer, fewer worries. The phenomenon of the philo that are the people who love us so much. So, yeah, a lot of Jews are very uncomfortable with non-Jews who love them. And embrace us so strong that we have very difficulties uh, to... Uh, Luke, didn't most uh, German Jews, say, in the 1920s, consider themselves Germans first? and Jews second. I'm not sure. First of all, people don't always have an accurate perception of themselves. That may be true, but that may not be how their loyalties were perceived by the Gentile, much of the Gentile population. Did the Nazis spare even the most assimilated Jews? Uh, they spared some Jews who were married to Germans, but uh, Generally speaking, the, the Nazis were anti-Jew, whether the Jew was a communist or the Jew was an Orthodox Jew. To take air, to, to breath. Philo-Semitism, the admiring interest and enthusiasm for Jews and Jewish culture by non-Jews, just like anglo Philo semitism If I really want to push the point English. here, it's almost as dangerous as anti-Semitism. Right, that's absolutely absurd, but it is, I, I think, a weak reaction by some Jews being absolutely afraid of philo-Semitism. If I have exaggerated positive notions about the Jews who are also fantastic musicians, the Jews who have this fantastic humor, that's not so dramatic. If the Jews are the chosen people, wouldn't that make them the master race? No, not necessarily. Every people on earth believes that they're specially chosen and have a special role to play in the universe. Jews want to steer mankind towards the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Uh, probably fewer than 1% or 2% of Jews in the world believe in uh, biblical prophecy. Dramatic, but this is part of the stereotyping, right? The Jews who are so smart. Why do we have stereotypes? Because generally speaking, stereotypes are accurate. And then twisting a little bit, the Jews who are so well in handling money, right? And then we have, these are kind of pseudo positive statements about Jews. The one about the money is obvious that how easy that can be anti-Semitic, but every positive statement can turn into its exact opposite. Okay, back to 2016 Amazon documentary here on the whole truth, everything you always wanted to know about Jews. In Berlin. Rather than a risky exhibition, we considered it a necessary exhibition I mean, a lot of German people have never met a Jewish person in their life. So how did you get the job? 
My mother actually saw an article in the New York Times about this. So this guy sits in a booth and the booth has a headline, something like, you know, talk to a Jew. Of it. And she wrote me an email in and said, you know, David, I think you should apply for this job. <laughs> It was not our idea to have a Jew in the box, but we wanted to have a Jewish guest who answers visitors' questions, who interacts with the visitor. It was very easy to get. I was actually, I was shocked. They didn't, they didn't, like, vet me at all. It was kind of like, you know, oh, you're Jewish? Yeah, go in the box, you know. I didn't, I didn't even have to prove I was Jewish. People don't come with concrete questions. They come with a sort of agenda, in a way. There is a certain generation, maybe, of German people who sort of, you know, almost want me to reassure them that everything is all right. They're not interested in how was it growing up as a Jew in Germany. Or they don't ask that at least. Maybe they are interested. All right, there's a 2016 documentary about Germans this and Jews. Patient and you think you know everything about it and then you, you find out there is another layer and another layer and another layer. And these layers never stop because in every issue, in every topic, you always find something where Germans are struggling with themselves and with their history and with their identity. And the same is true also. So generally speaking, people don't thrive when they're struggling with themselves and struggling with their identity and struggling with how they feel about themselves and how they feel about their people. So too, nations and peoples do not usually thrive when they're struggling about their identity and struggling with their history, right? The, the most adaptive approach is to have a positive view of yourself and of your people and of your people's history. For Jews living here, so we're both strugglers, fighters. It was a very strange feeling when I was offered a job in Germany. I debated a lot, should I come? And what may have helped me the most was the opportunity I had to interview Heinrich Boll, who was a very famous German novelist shortly before he died. I sense such a deep commitment and engagement with the German people from someone who was more aware than anyone of the evils of the Nazi era. And I finally said, do you love Germany? And he looked at me and he said, it's not going to be easy for you here. Yes, I do love the German people, but it's a very complicated relationship. And I think it somehow helped me, give me the feeling that it's not an easy black and white situation. The question is actually, do you think that it is possible that there is again a, a, a new identity that you feel as well German as well? Or do you, are you doing that already so that we overcome this, this Nazi distinction? It's absolutely not necessary for me to feel German. I'm a citizen of this country, of Germany. It's a democratic country. I love to live here. But it's for me absolutely not necessary to become a German. We became a multinational state. So generally speaking, I notice among Jews, the stronger their in-group identity, the less likely they are to identify with the Gentile state that is on their passport. It depends on how old you are. Yeah. 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 If I give you the answer, it's, I give you exactly the answer. I would have never been able to wear the jersey of the German national team. And the Jewish kids today can identify with the German national football team. So, to answer your question, it's a matter of time. This is aus meiner Sicht from in my Deutschland ein freies Land, in dem mein Sohn eben als Jude as leben Jew, kann, sich nicht schämen braucht, kein Problem hat. Und deswegen no ist es für mich ein, durchaus ein, ein, well ein Land, in dem man als Jude sehr gut leben kann. To call Germany a home? for me personally was um, not possible at all until last year when my son went to Vienna to play there for Maccabi Deutschland. Okay, so this is a Jewish sporting competition. So all sorts of people are alive today because of big sporting competitions. So you can have the worst people skills, right? You can be you know, the most maladaptive in your approach to life. And yet during major sporting events like the World Cup, Right, it's easy to form bonds and ties and to uh, participate in some sort of, you know, collective feeling. They came in and they were shouting, Deutschland, Deutschland. And it was a very strange feeling to hear your son 
Shouting Germany. Right, so these are German Jewish athletes screaming out the name Germany, identifying with Germany, wearing German uniforms. I did not realize that still I was wearing all the prejudice, all the judgments of my father about Germans and about Germany. I must admit that I did recognize very late in what a wonderful country I'm living in. I feel that I'm living in a very democratic country today, maybe in one of the most democratic countries in the world. Wow, doesn't that just warm, the, doesn't that just warm your heart that you're living in one of the most democratic countries in the world? That's, that's just such a fantastic basis for developing a strong, cohesive in-group identity and you know, developing a strong attachment and willingness to sacrifice to, to your people that you're, 